Hi, greetings. This is my first uh, Instagram live um, that I'm hosting myself with a guest. And my wonderful guest is Ashlyn Cahill. And Ashlyn, are you in there yet? I see absolute boats from Cannes are here. Imagine somebody all the way from Cannes. Hi. Um, so Ashlyn is coming on shortly. What's the weather like there in Cannes? Make us jealous. Ah, hi Ashlyn, you're here. Um, you'll have to tell us what the what the weather is like in Cannes. It's not too bad here in Waterford in Ireland, I should say in Rhine, on Rhine, outside Dungarvan. So I'm going to invite Ashlyn to join me now, and we're going to talk about the whole processes of conveyancing. And conveyancing is the term used for selling property, the legal terminology. And there's a lot of frustrations around how long it takes to go from when you sale agreed the property to the time that the sale actually takes to close. So you're all going to be so much wiser after Ashling gives her advice, her guruness here. So Ashling, I'm just going to invite you now. Um, go live with Ashleen. Waiting for Ashleen. This is like the um, Eurovision here. Hi, Olivia. Good to see you. Hi, Hi Ashleen. How are you? Good, good. Enjoying the nice weather. Brilliant. It's fantastic to have you here. Ashley and I were chatting the other day and I said, why don't we do a face, an Instagram live? And she was all up for the challenge. Right? <laughs> Hopefully all will go well. Of course it will. We're here. We're here and we're well. Tell me, how are things going with you right now, Ashley? Are you busy? So it's still very busy from the point of view that there are still matters ongoing. Now, new matters obviously have decreased, but there's still sales completing. I'm still issuing contracts. There's life goes on I suppose so I'm using this time now to try and get caught up on as many things as I can uh, so it is it's is still very busy. Brilliant Thanks. you're telling me that you're working on closing some sales and you've got some uh, so there's plenty going on it's not like it's all frozen it's still no. happening albeit slower. Absolutely no things are still going on I think people are just that little bit more nervous now but still things I got in sale agreed last week on a new matter again so I have to get new contracts out on that and I've got a new set of contracts in on a purchase. So still, things are still going ahead. Fantastic. Great. The world hasn't completely stopped entirely. Um, great. So look, a big frustration for sellers, buyers and estate agents is the length of time it takes to yeah. actually close a sale. So we go off, we have a lovely house to sell to help the seller move on in their life. And we find the buyers, we negotiate the best price. Then we feel like it's all lost. It's out of our hands. It seems to drag on. I think it's 16 weeks. Hi, Gina Kelly. I think it's 16 weeks. They're saying that it's on average. Um, the Institute of Auctioneers and Valuers are reporting for sales to close. So will you give us um, some tips in terms of what will it take to actually um, move the sale on quicker? What's the number one thing, the first and foremost? Well, title deeds tends to be the thing that slows things down the most. So it's where sellers will only go and apply for title deeds uh, when the sale is agreed. It, on average, it takes at least four to six weeks for those deeds to come in. So you're four to six weeks lost where contracts are not issuing. Purchasers aren't able to push on until the contracts issue. So that can be, I think, the slowest part. So if the sellers have already applied for the title deeds, now this is obviously for mortgages, where mortgages are in place, the banks will hold the title deeds and the sellers need to obtain those title deeds on trust from the banks so that contracts can be prepared and can issue. Okay, that's very good. I'd like to say hello to Ray Smith, who's joined us, Maria Clifford, my lovely colleague Maria and fellow director. And Ray is based in Cavan and he's a fantastic guy. I'd like to give a shout out for anyone thinking of selling property in Cavan, as they say. Um, so back to business, um, Ashlyn, like really, I found out the other day the title deeds are actually in these big warehouses in Kildare and uh, Dublin. And that there's a fella going around with a trolley pulling these title deeds off the shelves. Um, so no wonder it takes so long. 
Well, as well as that, they want to be paid up front as well. So you've got the time it takes for them to locate the deeds. You've got the time it takes for them to actually respond to you. And then they want money first. And only when they get money will they then release the, the deeds. So it really, it just, uh, uh, if you're very, very lucky, you might get them within about two weeks. But the majority of time, it takes four to six weeks. And it can take a lot longer at times as well. So imagine, because I want to really drive this point home, if people leave this chat or watch it afterwards, hi Caroline, that they will kind of take home this one piece of gold. Um, so when is the right time to hire a solicitor and start looking for uh, getting the title deeds? Uh, when you're putting the property on the market. Um, is the time to go have a chat with your solicitor. There's forms that you can sign at that stage. The solicitor can send off those forms to the bank and that, that can start the process of the title deeds. It's also a good time to talk to your solicitor about any possible issues. So maybe your house is on a private roadway, so there might be paperwork that needs to be put in place for that. Some of the services may not be on the site. There might be paperwork needs to be put in place for that. So it's, it's the time to have that chat. You know when you say the services, I know what they are. For, but for the purpose of anyone listening in, what kind of services are you talking about, Ashling? So water and septic tank, basically, or sewerage. And so if it's public water and public sewerage, the hope is that they're connected at the road in front of you and that that road is public. Uh, but it isn't necessarily guaranteed. So it's just easier to have that chat with your solicitor in advance than the water supply and or the septic tank might be or obviously private. And again, it's just have that chat with your solicitor to see if there's anything that needs to be put in place. Very good. So what you're actually saying is uh, that even though the, the, the services such as water and waste um, may be on the public um, system, um, that might not be as neat and as tidy uh, from a legal perspective as it should be. There's no, no guarantee. There's no guarantee. And as well as that, a purchaser now will insist on getting a letter from the council confirming that they're public as soon as they leave your property. So that can take a couple of weeks to get that letter from the council. And so again, it's something that you can do in advance so that by the time contracts are issuing, you have the letter. It's not slowing anything down at the stage that you've agreed the sale. So do you mind me asking you a question, right? If somebody's um, property housing estate and they're availing of services like water and waste, right? from mm -hmm. the, the council, how can they not be on the system? What could have gone wrong? Have you, have you ever come across a situation where they weren't on the system? Uh, no, but with estates, they may not be taken in charge and the purchaser is entitled to know if the council have taken over the estate or not. And if they haven't, again, there's a letter of comfort they'll want from the council to say, all is well with the estate. We are taking it over the proper bond which is like an insurance bond for estates uh that that's still there and that everything is okay fantastic that's brilliant i did sell a property where they had their own um waste hi nora um where they had their own uh waste system on the land and their own well and there was no planning permission for the um for the waste system the waste treatment system that was a desperate headache Absolutely. And I, uh, I had one case acting for purchasers where the septic tank wasn't where it was meant to be on planning and mm. um, a, a retention permission was needed. And that causes a delay for an application for retention permission. You're looking at potentially four months and possibly more, depending on how long it takes for the plans to be done, application to go in, the final grant to issue. So this all delays matters. So it's, it's just easier to have that conversation early in the process so that if things need to be sorted, there is time to sort those before you're under pressure. David, thanks for joining us. Great to have you on board. Um, that's fantastic advice. And I suppose, look, if you were to imagine that we've sale agreed the house, now the owner decides to go and hire you or another solicitor, you request the title deeds, they're in this vault and poor old Johnny with the trolley is scooting up and down. We've got to send money to, to um, who, to the bank, isn't it? Yeah. To, to request the deed. So poor old Johnny could be five weeks foraging in the files for the title deed. Yeah. So we last five weeks after finding an amazing buyer who's in a hurry. Then we throw in a septic tank for good measures that when you go and we probably have to get the buyer's engineer out uh, to discover this. Yes. 
Uh, so it's it's just easier to be prepared to advance. And it's a matter of just having a conversation to go through everything. So as I say, there's the title deeds as an issue, services like water and sewage potentially could be an issue. Uh, there's a certificate, for example, that's needed for septic tanks now. So that doesn't take very long to get, but it's just easier to get. Again, have it there in advance, another box ticked. Um, there's also issues that come, sorry, I'm just looking at my own checklist now so I don't forget anything. Great. Uh, so there's not expect from a really good solicitor that they check. <laughs> uh, the next thing then would be local property tax is another issue that needs to be dealt with fairly quickly, uh, but it's an easy thing to do. It's just a matter of giving your solicitor the PIN number, property ID, or else giving them a printout of the local property tax history showing everything paid up to date. So that's a nice, easy one. Um, and yeah. if you... In, it's no big deal you just apply online so it's all as I say nice and easy another certificate that can take time so again better to do it in advance it's it's a certificate to do with the NPR charge so this was a charge that came in between 2009 and 2013 for houses that weren't principal private residences so NPPR um, where you were living in the house for that time you'll be entitled to a certificate of exemption the council provide that, but they insist on a declaration. Yes, I was living there, thank you very much, and paperwork to prove it. So they normally would look for either a bank statement for each year or a revenue letter for each year. And it's finding those can be the most uh, frustrating thing for sellers. So because you have to find one with the dates for 09, 10, 11, 12, and 13. And as I say, it's it's getting that paperwork together. And again, if you have time to do it, it's much easier and less stressful. Of course it is. And I suppose, look, in terms of the elephant room and the NPPR, um, let's uh, just talk about that for a second. Uh, landlord, for example, has yeah. rented their property or they've moved out of their home, they've rented it, it's no longer. So the NPPR, non-residents, what is it? Uh, non principal private residence tax, right? It. So it means that if it's not your home, it's not your principal residence, you have to pay tax on it. But you might have only a year or two where it wasn't your home, and you have to produce all the evidence in terms of your utility bills, yeah? That's it. So say you were living in it for three years and not for two. If you have the receipts for two years and statements to prove you were in the address for the first three years, you're sorted. It's just a matter of getting that paperwork to the council and then they'll provide the certificates. It just takes a couple of weeks to issue once they have the right paperwork. That's on the assumption that you've paid your non-principal private residency tax. So sadly, we've dealt with clients who hadn't heard of or had forgotten or were out of the country or for whatever reason, or maybe there's a little skeleton in the old closet. We all have a few of those and they haven't addressed it until the moment of truth. And the NPPR um, tax doesn't go away. Sure doesn't. No. It yeah. accumulates interest, doesn't it? I, they've tapped it for the moment, but it can be. So the charge would have only been about, I think, 200 per year at the time. If you, say, didn't pay any tax, um, the penalties now and charges are up at about, I think, 7,000 now, but they've capped them. And I don't think they've added anything more since they capped it. How can somebody find out if they paid their NPPR tax in the meantime, if they're at home and they're thinking, I'm ready to pull this skeleton out of the closet before I hire a solicitor and check is my NPPR done? Um, how, why would they do that? Well, they, they'll need, so there's NPPR.ie as the website. Um, and I think that it's possible to contact them. The council may also be able to find the record in the NPPR website, but they'll normally... So when you contact the council and say, I paid it for 2012 and 2013, they'll normally look for a reference. So I'm not sure how well they can invest. Go don't. on that. Okay, sorry now to go on about that one, but that has been a big pain point in some cases, especially for rental properties. Um, when is a good time to get the engineer's report, Ashling John? Well, I, if I'm acting for a purchaser, I normally want to get the contracts, all the planning documentation before the engineer goes in. And I'll be looking for the engineer to check structure, any remedial issues, um, check everything to do with planning and building regulations. If they apply to check the title map against the boundaries on the ground, to make sure everything is OK. And then if there's a septic tank, to check the septic tank and percolation area and see they comply with current regulations. So as I say, I'd normally look for that to be done as soon as contracts issue and I have the map and the planning documentation to try and give the engineer 
uh, everything he needs to do his inspection. So ideally, a purchaser will contact their engineer the minute they've decided they're going to buy this house. Correct. Get them in there fast. We've seen scenarios where purchasers are waiting up to a month for engineer to go and another two weeks for the port. So that's another six week delay on top of the whole delay process that's already happening. Yeah, no, it, you would want to have your engineer lined up because he does need time. They, they have other commitments. They need advance notice so that they can make sure they can schedule that inspection for when you need it. Brilliant. Sorry, now I'm reading my email that you sent me. Um, so, um, so in terms of your checklist, Ashling, that you give, so let's just imagine I'm your new client. So I'm yeah. thinking of selling and I'm going to see Ashling, I have, make my appointment. What are the key pieces of documentation that you start working on? Are you advised? Number one, ITA deeds. Number two, conversation about any issues like uh, maps, uh, private roadway or private water sewage, anything like that, just to make sure that's all okay. Um, the local property tax to start that paperwork, putting that in place, the NPPR certificate, putting that in place. Um, also to do have a conversation about the plan history of the property so that I know when the title deeds come in that I have everything I need. So sometimes the sellers may have built on an extension or a garage or something like that after they buy. They won't have needed necessarily to get an engineer to come in and certify that it's all okay that will be needed when you sell. So it's just to, I suppose, have that conversation. Also an, an issue that came, that's come up in the last few years, not with every property, but with some properties that are registered under the older system, the registry of deed system, they now need new maps because all of those properties when they're sold have to now be registered in the land registry. So that again, needs an engineer, needs a map, can take a little bit of time, better to have it done in advance. Fantastic, pure gold. So, you know, it's not just hire your, your agent, see how they get on and hope for the best and then hire a solicitor. You have to be looking at hiring your, your solicitor at the same time as you're hiring your estate agent. Isn't that right, Ashling? Yes, just to know what you need to be organising in the hope that once your sale agreed, everything can get up and running as quickly as possible. Now say hello to Katrina and to Cormac have joined us. If anyone's <laughs> Feel free to shoot them through. Um, in terms of buyers now, right? So have you dealt with situations, I'm sure you have, um, where you're, you're acting for a purchaser and they've gone through, they've found their home, the dream home, they're super excited, they're happy with everything. And next thing they're waiting on contracts and the other solicitor hasn't got them, they're just requesting them. Your man Johnny's forging for these... Uh, deeds inside this big warehouse so they're going to take a while and then the engineer is very busy so he doesn't get there for a while and then he spots that he spots, he spots that, all yeah. this stuff so he spots that there's no planning for the extension that the, the storage pit is in the wrong the waste treatment system um doesn't have a percolation um system um all these things can you recollect a situation dealing with a purchaser and how they've been devastated with the whole delays and the lack of communication and the whole process? Well, it's just the frustration. And my experience is that the longer it takes for a sale to go through, either when I'm acting for a purchaser or from a seller, the less likely it will complete. That's my experience because people will get too frustrated and they might find something else that they prefer to buy. Um, so I have acted in situations where the seller's will have thought they have their ducks in a row, but then the engineer goes in and discovers that there isn't planning permission for something that should have planning permission. Uh, that will in itself, if that has to be regularized before the sale completes, that's going to add three to four months at least to the sale process. And some people may not be willing to wait for that. That's the problem. And there's the cost of it as well. Yeah, the cost of it, sorry, I was just looking for your email there. I got distracted. Um, somebody was sending me a message. Um, the cost of it, so the, the price goes up in terms of the conveyancing cost, the cost of the solicitors and everything. Is that right? 
Not necessarily. It's the cost for the seller in getting an engineer in, getting plans done, getting the retention application in because the purchaser will want it to be the seller's problem because they won't obviously sign contracts without having that issue sorted. Now, maybe they are willing to take it on without that issue being sorted. But um, if they are borrowing from a bank, a bank is not likely to give you uh, money where there is a garage or a big extension that should have planning and doesn't. For them, for the bank, when they're loaning money, they want to make sure the property is saleable the minute that it's bought. And something like an extension or a garage could be seen as having a significant market value in itself. And then they won't let you buy it without having the proper planning in place for it. Well, I think that's great advice, Ashlyn. Um, so I'm looking here in terms of questions. Um, why are sellers obliged to deal with some issues and not with others that are raised by a purchaser's engineer? Um, like legal issues versus structural or remedial issues. Yeah, so basically um, when you're buying, especially if you have a mortgage in the background, you want to make sure that you have a saleable property. So any legal issue, and legal issue would be maybe a title map, the boundaries are wrong, that is a legal issue. Uh, planning permission isn't there or the proper paperwork isn't there, that's a legal issue. Um, the services, you don't have a legal right to access your sewer septic tank because it's on your neighbor's lands and there isn't the proper deed in place for that that's a legal issue so when you're selling you would normally be obliged to sort out those legal issues before the purchaser has to buy commercial issues are that you go in and you find out there's a huge crack that's going to take a lot of money to fix that's a commercial issue um, you may look for the seller to to either fix that issue or to drop the purchase price but it's a commercial decision between you and they they may or may not agree and if they won't agree to drop the price, you then decide whether you're willing to buy anyway or whether you'll meet them somewhere in the middle. So that's a commercial issue versus a legal issue. And the seller will be under more pressure to resolve a legal issue. Because if you're not willing to buy because of that issue or the bank aren't willing to loan money because of that issue, they're going to find a similar problem with anyone else they sell the property to. That's really good advice. Thanks, Ashlyn. I'd just like to say hello to Shamie and to Muriel who've joined us. Great to have you on board. If you've any questions, send them through. Um, that's very good. And I think, would you agree, Ashlyn, that the more problems that come up and especially the longer they take, doesn't trust kind of out the window and momentum? For sure. Absolutely. Um, because people won't understand why there is that issue. And like even dealing with banks as a selling solicitor where I've needed, we'll say banks uh, consent to sale. I have found it uh, ludicrous. Uh, the lack of, uh, I suppose, um, the lack of movement by the bank. It, they should be chomping at the bit to progress the sale so that they can get in as much money as they can and resolve an issue, especially where a house might be in arrears or in negative equity. Yeah. But instead, as where I'm selling. So I have control of my communication with the bank. I'm getting nowhere with them. And so the purchasers cannot understandably, on, they can't understand why it's so slow and so tedious at times. Um, so I can fully understand that, that people do get very frustrated. And if they get very frustrated with the process, it can put them off the property. And then they'll just go and decide to buy something else without those frustrations involved. And the agent has to try and drag the whole thing back and mediate between solicitors and everything. And it's very frustrating. I'd like to say hello to two good buddies of mine who've joined. Bridget Haberlin, how are you? And Adriana Hegarty. So I'd like to give a shout out to Adriana. She's a fantastic estate agent based in Middleton in County Cork. So if you're looking to recommend an agent, Ashley, there you go. Adriana is a woman who is great at selling and solving problems. Um, but really, I suppose the lesson here is to really, really encourage our sellers to go to their solicitor, get all the paperwork, and maybe for to just maybe one more time, especially for the people who've joined us, um, Ashley, to bang through again. Most important thing, hire your solicitor as soon as you decide to sell. The key yeah. pieces of paperwork are the key things that cause the mess, the things that have to be sorted early on. Lining your ducks up are? So title deeds, as I say, 
just discussing the property with the solicitor in case there's any issues about private roadway or about your septic tank being on your neighbour's property or something like that. Uh, so looking at just going through that with your solicitor in case it throws up any issues. Um, the local property tax, getting that a copy of or print out for your solicitor, nice and easy. Sorting out a certificate in relation to the NPR charge. If you were living in the house for between 09 and 13, you should get an exemption. But there's paperwork that has to be put in place for the council to do that. If you weren't living in it, hopefully you have receipts. And again, they just go into the council and the council issue a certificate. Um, I'm just trying to think now what else. And also to go through the full planning history with your solicitor in case there's any paperwork that should be there but isn't there. And then to organise that. Uh, and the title map. In case you take a photo of the property in its current state and show that photo to your solicitor because in actual fact, they just threw on some old thing and forgot to mention it and, to, and just didn't think it, it mattered. So it's just a practical thing that this list could look at some photos of the property. Absolutely. I got a set of contracts in at one stage uh, in the not too distant past telling me the house was built pre-1964, which it was, and that there were no extensions. I sent in the engineer with the usual checklist, check structure, planning, map and septic tank. And he came back to say that there was one extension built maybe in the 80s, another in the 90s. Not only that, but there were pictures, aerial pictures on the wall showing the original house and then the house with one extension and then the house with another extension. So, you know, it's, it's just to make sure uh, you, you have a full conversation with your solicitor because technically they probably thought they were right. The house was pre-64, but they failed to tell their solicitor that there was also about two or three extensions on it that were built in the 80s and 90s, you know. Just before we go next with that, I'd like to say hello to Liam Cronin. Liam from Pinergy. Uh, Liam is a great guy. He's our account manager and he's great to work with. So I just wanted to give him a shout out. Um, if you have any questions, Liam, throw them into the box there. Um, Ashley, have you, in terms of those extensions that had no planning, out of interest, did the sale go ahead? It didn't. Um, they did get retention, but for different reasons, it all fell apart, unfortunately. But again, there was a massive delay, you know. So the delays are not good. And in other words, they're not going to go away by not dealing with them. No. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Great. Um, just a couple of things in terms of electricity. We were talking about that recently. Um, that's something that maybe we need to be more mindful of is ensuring that if it's a vacant property or the owners are moving, there's a power supply. Does that come up with a problem sometimes on the last hour? Well, I, when, when I'm buying a property, it tends to be two standard questions that I'll ask uh, pre-contract. And one of those is, will the property continue to be connected to electrical supply up to and including completion? Because I don't want my clients to have completed the sale, they get their keys, they're all excited, and then the property is disconnected and there can be a substantial cost in reconnecting that property. So that tends to be one of them um, that I ask. And that's ever since, we'll say, the last recession where people may not have been able to keep up with their electrical bills and then the supply board come in and disconnect it. The other issue that I also tend to ask pre-contract is on insurance. Is it insured? Is there any extra premiums for any reason? And are all the usual risks uh, covered and that's to see is there an issue with um, flooding or anything or flood risk in a property um, just to be sure that everything is okay from the point of view of my clients coming in and then being able to insure the property when they buy. Excellent absolutely brilliant. Um, Ashlyn um, I really really enjoyed our chat uh, and this is Ashlyn's first ever <laughs> non -non <laughs> Is that right, Ashley? It is. It is. Yes. I'm feeling they're going to be knocking your door down. And I think we could maybe have another chat and talk about things from a buyer's perspective. What do you think? Are you up for the challenge? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. OK, so um, maybe we organize another chat this day next week at 12 o'clock, if your diary allows it. Yeah, that's good. What do you do as a buyer of a property and what you need to be looking out for. I'd like to say hello to Cloda Carl. How are you, Cloda? Cloda has Carl's Pharmacy in Waterford in the Glen, a fantastic family business and a business that definitely fall into the hero category. 
There's Nora again, and she's got a picture of her lovely dog on her profile. Um, is there anything that you think that we should add, that you want to add to the whole thing, Ashling? I don't think so. It's really just, as I say, a matter of being organized, making those, asking those questions early on in the process so that there's time to get them sorted because they don't have to be issues ultimately if they're all resolved before a purchaser even pays a booking deposit and you've agreed the sale. So it's, it's really just to have that initial conversation, get those bits and pieces organized so that you're, you're doing it without the stress of a purchaser getting frustrated and threatening to walk away. Fantastic. Ashling, what's your email address, please? Oh, lovely and long. Uh, it's ashling.cahill at cahillsolicitors.com. So A-I-S-L-I-N-G dot C-A-H-I-L-L at cahillsolicitors.com. So if you can't remember that, um, you can find, I, have you got a website, Ashling? Yeah, cahillsolicitors.com. And uh, we also have an info email. Great. So and you're John Garvin and I'm Regina at LibertyBlue.ie. If you want an introduction to Ashling and you have my details, um, it was a great chat. And aren't we very lucky here to be living in on Rhine in outside John Garvin and in West Waterford where the sun shines longer than anywhere else in <laughs> And I'd like to thank you, Regina, as well, for inviting me on and uh, for, for this opportunity. You're really brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure. And uh, a rising tide lifts all boats. And as we say in West Waterford, Sláin go fólgur, Míla Mahagut. Sláin.